Hello, health champions. Today, I want to reveal the shocking truth about fat. But in order to understand the issue completely, we have to understand what fat is, where does fat come from, and we have to understand the mechanisms of what happens in the body when we eat fat or when we don't. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Ekberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. In this video, I will share 10 principles with you about how fat works in the body. And it's critical that you understand all 10 of them, otherwise you won't have the whole picture. And you need the whole picture to know when fat is good for you and when fat might be bad for you. And if you stick around to the end, I'm going to give you a bonus that's going to tie it all together for you. So it's going to be clearer than it's ever been before. Let's just real quick talk about what fat is and what carbohydrates are. So on planet Earth, if you're a human or if you're any other life form on the planet, you are carbon based, carbon like in carbohydrate. All life forms on the planet are carbon based. So if you talk about a carbohydrate, carbon and hydration, that means carbon plus water. So water is H2O. So carbohydrate has carbon and hydrogen and oxygen which incidentally is exactly what fat has. It's just a different form, all right? It's still carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And that means they're somewhat interchangeable. That carbohydrate can be turned into fat. It's a better storage form, which we're gonna talk about in detail. We can't turn fat back into carbohydrate, but the fat is linked together in triglycerides and we can use the glycerol from the backbone and we can turn that back into glucose. So we always have a tiny little bit of carbohydrate that we can make from fat even when we're not eating any carbohydrate at all. And protein is also a carbohydrate in the sense it contains carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, but you just sprinkle in a little bit of nitrogen and now you have amino acids that can become protein. But fundamentally, they, they share a lot of building blocks. So that means they're somewhat interchangeable. They have different purposes at different times. But we're gonna focus on, on fat today and just understand where that comes from. Number one thing to understand is that your body is smart. It's not just smart, it's a miracle of intelligence. It's so perfect, so fine-tuned, so meticulous. Everything fits together. It knows exactly why it's doing what it's doing. When I hear people, and especially doctors, saying that we don't know why that happens, those things just happen sometimes. I cringe. Nothing ever just happens sometimes. The body does everything for a reason. And the number one reason it does anything is for survival. If we look back at human history, and if we look at any wild animal today, then we have an irregular food supply. Okay? There is not refrigerators for all the animals on the planet. They don't have three square meals plus snacks, and neither did humans until very, very recently. And because the food supply was irregular, then we had to set up a system where we could take advantage of when there was plenty so that we could survive when there wasn't so much. And we call that feast and famine. So during the feast, we had to have a way of putting some extra energy, some fuel in storage for the future so that when we hit a period where there wasn't so much food, then we had something to fuel the energy. Otherwise, we would be a very short-lived species. So storage is necessary for survival. So the next question then is, how do we store energy? And we can do it in two forms primarily. Even though protein also contains energy, 
the body saves it for last because we need the muscle for propulsion. We need to be able to walk and work and fight and the muscles perform that work so we don't want to burn off the muscles too early and that's why the body always saves it for last. And the two ways that it can store energy, the other two ways is in the form of glycogen or fat. The glycogen is extremely limited. I know you hear people talking about glycogen storage all the time, but we have to put it in perspective and realize the body is very, very poor at storing glycogen. The most you can store is about 1500 calories worth. That's less than one day's energy supply of glycogen. If you depended entirely on glycogen, you would never live an entire day. The species would die out within 24 hours unless we could constantly find food every day. So the first day the species was without food, we'd be wiped out. And when we look at that 1500, we have to realize about three quarters of that is in the muscles. And that glycogen is earmarked for the muscles. So even though your brain and your tissues and your red blood cells need some glycogen, they can never get it from the muscle. The glycogen goes in the muscle and stays there. So if we want to retrieve some glucose for the rest of the body, for the brain and organs, then we have to go to the liver and then we're limited to 400 calories a day, right? That's very, very little glycogen. We wouldn't last very far if that's all we depended on. So the best fuel for survival and necessity for survival is to be able to store fat. So if a somewhat overweight person weighs about 200 pounds, this is not like morbidly obese, this is just like high average today, 200 pounds body weight, 40% body fat, that's 280,000 calories worth of fat. That's a fortune that's stored away as energy. We could live six months off of that energy without adding anything except water and some vitamins and minerals, basically. So compare six months to one day and you start understanding why fat is so critical for survival. We would never make it unless we could put some fat into storage and unless we had a way of using that fat for energy and during a fast we'd have to have be able to live off of fat only. And the third principle is to understand then why did the body pick fat? Why do all animals store energy excess as fat? And the reason is because it's most efficient. One gram of carbohydrates stored as glycogen also binds three grams of water. It's like a sponge. It sucks water. It holds water to it. So one gram of glycogen actually weighs four grams and it gives us four calories. So if we were to store energy in the form of glycogen, we would have one calorie per gram stored. Whereas with fat, we have one gram equal nine calories. So fat is nine times more efficient for our survival. And if we were to store, let's say that a thin person like myself, I have about 100,000 calories worth of fat stored on my body. And I think it's reasonable to think that that's about what a lean person, not an emaciated, but a lean person would need to survive the winter. Okay? You go a few months with less food, so you need to be able to burn a little bit of extra fat every day for the, the winter months. So somewhere around 100,000, just hypothetically. If that was stored as fat, we would need about 30 pounds. If it was stored as glycogen, we would need to store 270 pounds worth of glycogen if we include the water that it binds. So if you're going to carry around on your body, you're going to carry around your energy reserves. You want a backpack that weighs 30 pounds or you want a backpack that weighs 270. All right, that's pretty evident. 
So the only way that we could survive, the only way that we could store enough energy to make it would be in the form of fat. That is why we don't store carbohydrate. We store a tiny little bit and the rest of it gets very quickly converted into fat. Principle number four to understand is how does the body create fat and store fat? And the answer is insulin. Insulin is our storage hormone. The purpose of insulin is to increase. When we eat something, our blood sugar goes up and the purpose of, of insulin is to take the body from a catabolic or breakdown state into an anabolic or buildup or storage state. That's what insulin does. And if we eat carbohydrates, we have a large insulin response. If we eat protein, we have a medium insulin response. And if we eat fat, we have a virtually zero insulin response. It's a negligent insulin response to fat. And why is that? Because carbohydrates gets absorbed in the bloodstream the fastest and when blood sugar goes up, that's a good thing to a point, but really high blood sugar or really low blood sugar is very toxic to the brain. Diabetics can go into a coma from either high or low blood sugar. So when we get high blood sugar from high carbohydrate consumption, that's an unstable situation. That's an emergency. The body has to bring that down quickly and that's why the insulin response to carbohydrates is so much higher than to protein or fat. Another way of saying that is that carbohydrates, because they have to get out of the bloodstream faster, they get in the bloodstream faster, they get, have to get out of the bloodstream faster, they get processed quicker, which means we are ready to eat again sooner. And that's a good thing if we're trying to put on fat for the winter. It's a bad thing because we get hungry all the time and that's the advantage of protein and fat because they're absorbed slower, they stay in the bloodstream longer and there is no urgency to get them out of there. We get full longer. We get very satiated so we don't have to eat so often. So insulin is a fat storing hormone. It's a fat creating hormone and it also is a hormone that prevents fat burning. Principle number five, and this is something that very often gets lost in the arguments. We hear vegans and low carb and carnivores and high carb and we have all these different people and all these different arguments and what they miss is that any excess will be stored. Any excess will trigger extra insulin because any excess has to be stored. That's the purpose of it. Okay? Anything that is extra that we're not using in this moment has to be stored. If we fill up our glycogen stores, the excess has to be converted to fat. We don't have a choice. That's just the way it works. So it doesn't matter if you eat more protein or more fat or more carbohydrate. If it's in a combination that's extra and it triggers insulin, which it will if it's extra, it will get stored as fat. Number six. So if this is how it works, then is fat storage a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I know what you're thinking because if you're like most people, then you have a little bit of extra and you don't like it. So you think, well, fat storage is obviously a bad thing. However, from an evolutionary perspective, if we think back a hundred thousand years, then fat storage again was a means to survival. If we lived in a world of feast and famine, then fat storage allowed us to store some extra fuel, which then allowed us to use it and survive. But that's the key, that there's a balance between storage and usage storage and usage. And when we live in a world of abundance and especially in a world of high carb abundance, 
Now we're only getting the storage component of that equation. We've completely lost the time where we empty the vault because there's never a famine. And now we end up with something called chronic congestion. That we eat something, insulin puts it away, and before we get a chance to use it, we eat again and we put it away. We eat again and we put it away. We end up with chronic congestion. We're stuffing, we're overfilling every cell of the body, and that is what leads to the metabolic syndrome that causes most degenerative disease. Number seven is a big question, and there's a lot of arguments around this. There's a low-fat camp and there's a high-fat camp, and the low-fat camp claims that fat, dietary fat, causes insulin resistance, and they've got the research papers to prove it. And what they're basing that on is a bunch of observational research that says that when they observe a cell that is packed with fat, that cell is also insulin resistant. It's an insulin resistant cell. And they can even show that the fat in that cell is signaling to block the action of insulin. So they are right. A fatty cell is insulin resistant and it is signaling further insulin resistance. But what they're not asking is how did that cell become insulin resistant? They're assuming that because there is fat in the cell and the cell is insulin resistant, the fat must be the cause rather than a co-conspirator rather than just something that happens at the same time. So we have to understand that the insulin is what puts the fat in the cell that makes the cell insulin resistant. And the insulin resistance is a result of the cell being overstuffed. It's over congested. And it didn't matter if we eat carbohydrate or protein or fat. If we ate too much of something, then the excess would be stored as fat and that cell becomes insulin resistant because it says, I've got enough. You've stuffed me plenty, leave me alone. I don't want that insulin to give me any more of what I, don't, what I already have. So dietary fat does not cause insulin resistance. Cellular fat is associated with insulin resistance and dietary fat in itself does not trigger insulin and so it can't cause insulin resistance. We're going to talk about some other cases, some combinations where it is still not a good thing, but we'll explain that. Principle number eight. What is the primary fuel of the body? If you look online, if you look at the USDA, you look at Mayo Clinic, you'll see over and over and over that they say that carbohydrate is the primary fuel of the body, that the brain can only run on glucose and so forth. And all of that is wrong. The body will run primarily on glucose when glucose is in abundance and is being continuously supplied. That does not mean it's the primary fuel. It means it's the fuel that needs to be disposed of first because high blood sugar is toxic. The brain does not only run on glucose when we have a famine, when we have a fast, when we go for a longer period of time without food, the body makes ketones. And during a fast, when carbs are in low supply, the brain uses as much as 75% ketones for fuel. Carbohydrate is not the primary fuel. It turns out that fat is the primary fuel. And if, we, if you understand anything about how the body stores fat for survival, you have to understand that fat is the primary fuel because during a famine, you're gonna run on 95% fat. You're gonna spare the protein for the most part. You, you'll lose a percent here and there, but there are no carbs added, so the carbohydrates are gonna come from that glycerol backbone, and the other 95% of your energy is gonna come from fat. So if you're on a keto diet or if you're on a fast, then you're gonna burn about 95% fat and 5% carbohydrate. And here's an interesting 
parallel that a lot of people, like the extreme low-fat people, they say you need to eat less than 10% fat in your diet. Your body can't run on 10% fat. There is absolutely no way because most of the organs at rest work best on fat. So if you eat 10% fat, your body will turn carbohydrates into fat because you can't use all those carbohydrates in the moment and your heart and your liver and your kidneys, they actually prefer fat. So if you eat virtually no fat, your body will convert carbs into fat. So you're, you're using about 50% carbs and 50% fat anyway. There is no way to make the body run on 10% fat because it will convert carbs into fat to bring that ratio up to around 50-50. I don't know the exact number, it could be 40-60, but a lot of the carbs get converted because the organs prefer fat. The only thing that carbohydrate or glucose is necessary for is the brain. During a fast, it still needs about 25% of its energy from glucose. The red blood cells run only on glucose. They don't have any mitochondria. They can only get energy from glycolysis, but that's a very small percentage of your body weight. So they don't use an enormous amount. Plus they don't do any work. They just float around. And the only other thing that you absolutely have to have carbohydrates for is emergencies but you never run completely out. Your muscles always store some glycogen. And if you have to make a run for it and you make lactic acid, then that lactic acid came from carbohydrate. That lactic acid is a byproduct of glycolysis, of breaking glucose in half. So during an emergency, when you have to make a sprint, when you have to create lactic acid, and huff and puff, then glucose is required. But you don't need a ton of it because that period of time is not gonna be very long and the muscles are always gonna store some. Principle number nine, does eating fat make you fat? And even though I promote low carb and high fat and lots of people do high fat and they lose weight, it's not completely as simple as that because if you're on a high carb diet then eating fat makes you fat because remember it's the insulin that stores fat it's the insulin that puts the food away and makes you hungry so if you eat high carb and high fat you will get fat and this is a problem with a lot of studies that they do they call it a low carb, high fat diet. And they think 60% carbs is normal when they set out to do these studies. So they drop that down to 40% and they think that's low carb. But 40% is still an enormous amount of carbohydrate compared to when you're fasting or you're eating a ketogenic diet. So 40% carbohydrate is still going to keep your insulin sky high and when insulin is sky high then you're going to store fat and you can't burn fat. So remember that you can't eat high fat unless you go very low carb. It's not a good idea. If you eat low carb meaning less than 10% carbohydrate or in ketosis as low as 5% then high fat does not make you fat. It means makes you satiated it allows you to go longer between meals, so in the end, you end up eating less food and burning more fat. Principle number 10. So we've pretty much agreed that fat overall is a good thing, but there's still fats that heal and there's still fats that kill. And the good fats are the ones that nature produced for us. A saturated fats in animal fats, natural fats in fish and meat and nuts and avocados. All the natural fats are good, especially if we eat them in the food that they came from. If we eat the whole food, then that food protects the fats and keeps them stable and all their nutrients available. We can also make oils 
if we process them lightly. So butter, coconut oil, extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, if they're lightly processed, then they're still good. They're still very, very close to the way that nature made them. And saturated fats are great because they're stable. You can leave butter out on the counter. It gets soft, but it doesn't go rancid. It doesn't get ruined in immediately. The bad fats are man-made fats. It's fats that we alter. We take a bean or a seed or we take corn, something that doesn't have a lot of fat in it to start with. And now we have to extract the fat with petroleum solvents and with extremely high pressure and extremely high heat and chemicals. And then we deodorize it and clean it and so forth. These are so destroyed, they're so altered that they are oxidized and rancid and that harsh processing turns them basically poisonous. On top of that, they're very high in omega-6s, which are inflammatory. So there are good fats and bad fats. And even though the bad fats will still help you reduce insulin resistance, it will still accomplish most of the things we saw here. That's in the short term. In the long term, you need to eat whole food. You eat, need to eat the things that nature produced because they will provide the nutrients and they're not going to be toxic so you can be healthy for the long run. So now that you understand the 10 principles, now that you have them down cold, then we can tie it all together. And we want to think about all of this that we've talked about as momentum. And you can have momentum toward storage or you can have momentum toward usage. You can have momentum towards congestion, clogging, or you can have momentum toward cleaning. And of course, the storage is associated with insulin resistance and having excess. The usage is associated with insulin sensitivity and it is the opposite. It's when you're, you're cleaning, it's when you're using more than you're putting in. So if fat is good or not, depends on the quality of the fat, of course, but it depends on where you are. Where is your momentum? So it doesn't mean that you have completely resolved your insulin resistance, but you have to be moving away from insulin resistance. If you're still eating in a way that you're becoming more insulin resistant and more clogged, then fat is not good. It's not necessarily worse than anything else you eat, but you're still, your momentum is still toward congestion and fat isn't going to help you. If you are moving, if you've cut the carbs enough, if you cut the, the carbs and the, the frequency of meals enough that you're using more than you're storing, you've shifted the momentum toward cleanup, toward decongestion, and now fat is good because fat now helps you further reduce insulin resistance. It makes you satiated. It helps you eat less. Even though fat, dietary fat has the highest calorie density, it is very satisfying and it doesn't trigger insulin. So eating more fat allows you to eat fewer calories overall and it allows you to move away from congestion. And now fat is a good thing. For some of you, that truth may not have been so shocking, but what's shocking to me is the number of people out there who still have no idea that fat is okay. And when you look around in the grocery stores, you see thousands of low-fat and non-fat products promoted as guilt-free and heart-healthy. That is shocking. So I hope you found this useful and that you share this information with anyone that you know who's still stuck with the idea of fat phobia because it is hurting them. If you enjoyed this video, make sure that you check out that one as well. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.